The sea was regarded as frightening, so for those who couldn't pluck up the courage to get into it, it was recommended they drink it instead. And this peculiar looking drink is the prescription of Dr. Richard Russell. And this will cure absolutely anything, if you believed him. It's a pint of seawater boiled with milk and cream of tartar. Now I'm going to tell you what it tastes like. <laughs> that tastes exactly like vomit. And I'd rather have a swim in the sea than drink a pint of that. To preserve their modesty, ladies wore long dresses weighted down with lead so that they wouldn't reveal anything that shouldn't be seen by gentlemen. They were taken down to the waters in horse-drawn bathing machines and helped in by doctors and elderly matrons. No such luxury for me. So I might have got it a bit too quickly, but that was really rather <laughs> strangely pleasant. It's certainly woken me up. It's roused up my drowsy spirits and it's, it's invigorated my stupid mind. I really quite enjoyed it, but I can see why some Georgian ladies thought it was all too much. They never did it again. <laughs> Over the next hundred years, between 1750 and 1850, Britain would now plunge headlong into the greatest social and economic change in its history, the Industrial Revolution. Alongside cotton mills and steam trains came gas lamps and the first kitchen range. This age of invention would transform the home and culminate in the Great Exhibition of 1851, the greatest showcase for British technology the world had ever seen. The watchmaker, Alexander Cumming, became the first to reinvent Sir John Harrington's Ajax toilet in 1775. But it was at the Great Exhibition that the masses would not only see new pieces of bathroom technology, but also use a flushing toilet for the first time. The lack of public toilets had once restricted women's mobility outside the home. But now the streets of London could potentially be transformed. 51 Bedford Street is not a well-known address, but it's so important in the history of London. It's now a newsagent's, but this is where the first public toilets for women were. This was just in the wake of the Great Exhibition of 1851, where over 800,000 people used the public loo and really were impressed by it. Unfortunately, it didn't really catch on here. There were two reasons for this. Firstly, women were ashamed to be seen to be using a public toilet. Women weren't supposed to go. They also weren't expected to be out on the streets of the city. Secondly, it was expensive. It cost you tuppence to actually use the toilet, another two to wash your hands. So that's fourpence. That's not exactly spending a penny, is it? The public loo didn't catch on immediately, but the flushing toilet did. And the main beneficiary of this loo revolution was not a person but a city, Stoke-on-Trent. A regional hub of the Industrial Revolution, it was here in the kilns of its potteries that the world's toilets would be made. In a gallery devoted entirely to the humble loo, I'm meeting Angela Lee, a curator who knows more about toilets than anyone else on earth. So Stoke-on-Trent, it's really the toilet capital of the world, isn't it? I've never seen so many different toilets before. Is it truly the largest collection in the whole world? It is. That's incredible. This museum is filled with hundreds of toilets, all of which were patented by a number of competing Victorian inventors. The most famous of them all was Thomas Crapper, a man who many believe to have been the sole inventor of the flushing loo. It would be great if you could explode for me the myth of Thomas Crapper. Thomas Crapper 
is important in sanitation history, but not for the reasons that people think he is. He didn't invent the flushing toilet? No, he didn't invent the flushing toilet because no one person did, and crap doesn't come from his name. That's such a disappointment. It is, I know, <laughs> and, but it's a really old word meaning rubbish or waste or something you desperately want to get rid of. In the 18th century, people were using chamber pots and closed stools in different rooms of the house, sometimes with other people present, but now this becomes a completely solitary activity. It does. I mean, I think there has always been a sense of privacy, if you could afford it. So in the Victorian age, poo becomes taboo. I mean, certainly you didn't want to be seen, and that was a problem with the early toys. They were jolly noisy. So quite often what would happen was you'd use the chamber pot and then empty it into your flushing toilet when there was nobody else about. Elizabeth I's Ajax had failed to prevent noxious gases rising up its pipes and into the palace. But all these toilets featured the great technological breakthrough, U-bend and S-bend pipes. When flushed, the curve of the pipes created water traps which prevented smells from coming back up into the room. With this design breakthrough, toilets of all shapes and sizes flooded the market, determined to win over the public with some fabulous names. It seems to me that people are inventing new types of toilet every 10 minutes throughout the 19th the, century. Certainly the 1870s, it's like mobile phones. They're going off in all different directions. Every company wants to get into this new big market of making toilets. But then 10, 15 years later, it's all settled and we have the British standard toilet, the toilet we know today. As Victorian England fell under the spell of the flushing loo, the sudden surge in mass flushing created a major public problem. In order to see just how big a problem it was, I've come to the Northern Outboard Sewer in London. Until the 1840s, your own sewage was your own problem. You kept it in your own cesspit that belonged to your house, or you paid night, night soil men to take it away. What happened in the 1840s was that the government said, you've got to link up your water closets to the general drains, which were used for um, surface water. It was a good idea, but it just didn't work, because the drains couldn't take it. They weren't designed for it. And literally, if there was a storm, all the sewage came back up and exploded all over Hoburn, <laughs> for example. 1858 was the great stink when the Thames was absolutely horrific and everyone realised London needed new drains. The answer, the solution to the whole problem, we can see it down there. And that solution was the world's first purpose-built sewer system, built by the engineer Joseph Bazalgette. I think they could just lower me down, like a... Like a carcass. You float down like an angel. <laughs> you know, out the, descend out the heavens. All right. Where's the floor? Go on, loose. Down you come. A couple more steps. Not very deep. Say about a couple hundred mil. All right. Am I standing in actual poo here? You are indeed. Yeah. <laughs> You're not up to your neck in it yet. <laughs> right. Lay up top. All right, loose. Welcome to uh, barrel number three of the Northern Outfall Sewer. I can see why people say the sewers are like a cathedral, because it is a bit... It is. ...echoey and spectacular. Are you impressed as an engineer today with what Basil Jett did? Yes. You think he was good at his job? He was bloody marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> Three cholera epidemics had swept over London by the mid-1800s, killing more than 100,000. Cholera was still believed to be transmitted through bad air or miasma. The sewers were designed to enclose it and London's waste, carrying it away from the rivers for the first time. Measuring 1,300 miles and built in just nine years, this remarkable feat was followed by similar schemes all over the land. So Bazalgette and his amazing sewers they allowed the modern bathroom to happen. You couldn't have water closets until Basil Jet came along and made this transformation. With the creation of the sewers and a citywide network of lead pipes to replace the wooden pipes of the past, houses could now be built with a wonderful new feature, piped water which went not just to the basement, but to all areas of the house, in particular to a completely new room, the bathroom. In order to see some really advanced Victorian plumbing, I've come to this London house. I'm being shown around by its curator, Rena Suleiman. 
essentially used by the servants. And they had a, a, a what they called a revolving uh, wash basin or a tip-up sink. You have your wash and you revolve it and the water rushes out and you can see right down the drain there, that's how it works. This house was rented in the 1870s by the artist Linley Sanborn. It came not only with a downstairs toilet, but also plumbed in bathrooms. For Mrs. Sanborn, though, being connected to the sewers was not a wonder, but a curse. Here we go. So this is Mrs. Sanborn's bedroom, and this is her own plumbed in wash basin. Wash basin, but it would have been considered quite avant garde at the time. Now, I've got this idea that she, well, she didn't like drains. And having been down the sewer, I can really understand that. It was disgusting down there. And she kept the plug in at all times. She did, and not only did she keep the plug in, but she hardly ever used it. And she doesn't like that. She's still using the old system, which is all laid out here. And that down there is the chamber pot, which she's still using, even though there are three plumbed-in toilets mm. in this house. Now, I don't blame her, because it's kind of nicer in here than it is in the cold, stony bathroom. And people would have seen her if she'd gone to the bathroom, which is immodest. Yes. And also, given the costumes that they were wearing as well, it would have been quite cumbersome, I think, the myriad of skirts that they had underneath them, so to be able to pull those up. You'd need to be in private, in a big room with a chamber pot. Yeah. And Mrs Sanborn was not alone. In Dundee, a Mrs Owler claimed to have been poisoned by the proximity of her bedroom sink to the city's main sewer. Mr Sanborn, however, had a little more faith in his plumbing. Ta da We're in a recognisably modern bathroom for the first time. Yes. Here it is. This is the 1880s, is it, that he has this put in? He does. Mr Sanborn had a cold bath here every morning, as he didn't have hot water yet. Although, as an artist keen to explore the new medium of photography, he didn't use the bath just for bathing. This whole bath was designed to house his chemicals, so this shelf was fitted. Uh, just ah. here. So he, when he was doing the photographic stuff, he'd open up the shelf and put put all the equipment on here. Yeah, we've got a few photos here. They're rather interesting. What's going on with these? Photography was very key to his, the, the way that he worked. He referred to them as his pencil sketches. And he would develop these photographs and trace them and, and do his final drawings for punch. Now, was it absolutely essential that all these ladies were naked? No, <laughs> no. No. And what does his wife think about all of this? Well, the interesting thing is, is Mrs King, who was um, one of Sanborn's favourite models, who came here um, to be photographed. And that's actually... That table survives and is in the morning room. And That's in his own morning room, in his own house? Yes. Does his wife know that Mrs King was sitting in the morning room with no clothes on? Well, no. Well, if you, you have to read their diaries in parallel for that particular day. So she's actually holidaying in Ramsgate. Oh, so she's well out of the way when Mrs King... And uh, he's house. given the servants the day off. I've got a book of bathroom porn here. It's full of new technologies that exploded in the late 19th century. Between 1855 and 1900, 4,700 people applied for a patent to do with some new bit of bathroom kit. And the middle classes are creating bathrooms that we would recognise. This is where it all starts in the late 19th century. Whereas toilet technology had been the obsession of the 1840s, now it was the turn of other fixtures and fittings. There's things in this book like power showers. There's one here that looks just like the rainmaker shower that you can get today and it's hugely expensive. Charles Dickens had a shower that was called the demon. Don't you love that? What all these patents revealed was that bathing had now become an established part of middle-class life. Theories on the role of miasma, or bad air, in spreading disease were finally debunked by the discovery of germs in the late 19th century. Now, daily bathing was no longer seen as a novelty, but as a medical necessity. Soon, even people lower down the social scale began to see improvements in sanitation. So, in order to see how the other half lived, I've come to the Back to 